I'm yeah, used to hear stuff. Yeah, yeah, and I, I come oh, off. Okay. Okay. Oh, I know. Hello, everybody, and welcome. Welcome, welcome to Building Wealth Together. Back to the basics. We miss y'all since last week. It's been a whole seven days, and I hope everybody is safe. Uh, you have your power and your water restored. Uh, if not, we are praying with you and for you. God is good and he's able. Uh, but yeah, building wealth together, back to the basic. What is it all about? Well, I'm Rosby, as Rosby, principal broker, CEO of R Group Realty. And I have a very, very good, 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 good team with me today. My co-host, we'll introduce them in just a moment. But what is this show all about? Well, we build wealth through credit, real estate, insurance, mortgage, holistically. We just bring the pearls to the table. We bring the buffet to the table. You eat what you want. Credit, real estate, insurance, mortgage, like I said, and from a holistic standpoint, we understand and know that we don't have all the answers. So that's why we bring awesome speakers to give you an awesome toolbox and a toolkit where you can just pick what you want. But the thing is, change is things. You gotta just do it. So today we will go around the room and we're going to introduce ourselves and our wonderful speaker, but we're celebrating a special occasion this month. It's Women's History Month. Women's History Month. Now, according to the government, this is a time that we commemorate and celebrate those sheroes, those ladies who have paved the way in history. And I'm just saying we can, we can always celebrate those who have made history, but we are making history right now, today, each and every one of us. And we have brought to the table today, one of my personal friends, mentors, coaches, Ms. Bev Wright. And we are going to talk a little bit with Bev about her journey. But before we do, let's go around the table. Melly Mel, Melly Michelle, tell hey, people hey. what's up. <laughs> <laughs> hey, what's up? <laughs> hey, yes, it is Melanie. Melanie Williamson, other known, other, otherwise known as uh, Melanie Michelle. Uh, Rosby, you know, I love you. I love your intros, your enthusiasm, and your, you just, you, you, you bring this group together in a way that we just love coming every week. And and for what we're bringing to the table for me is that credit education. As a credit educator, I work with clients and loan offices all over the United States. And there's a team of us. Uh, there's It's not just me. I am kind of that middleman mediator. And I'm trying to bring information and education on credit, credit literacy, to help people get into those homes, get those refis. Uh, to get linked up to the right people. So I am so excited to be here on this Women's History Show. This is going to be a pretty phenomenal month. And for all those women out there, powerhouse women doing your thing, kudos to you and um, have a great, great month. Hey, who's next? Roz, I'm going to let you intro this time. <laughs> well, I hear Rhonda. She's yes. coming with power. She's really passionate. <laughs> the lone lioness. <laughs> <laughs> I knew y'all had something in your back pocket today. I had to let. <laughs> hey, wait, Go I on. Talk to, we could just do things like that when you gelled and connected together, you know, <laughs> just not in the community, but also personally. But I am Rhonda Hutchison. I am the lone lioness uh, in you heard that? I am the loan lioness, so that means one and only. I am with Paramount Residential Mortgage Group. I am a residential mortgage group, and just like I roar with passion and power, and excited, excited about what we have in store for you today, this month, but especially on today, we have a very special guest, and I just can't wait to get started to hear from her, but uh, yeah, I'm just ready to get started, but glad to be here again with my, with my BWT family and our special guest. Mr. Chris, I guess um, it's your turn. <laughs> I'm Chris Ziegler with the Ziegler Agency Allstate located in Frisco, Texas. As everybody knows, I service the whole state of Texas. And what's my motto? 
Customer service with a personal touch. Customer service with a personal touch. And I'm excited about the show today as well. And got a lot of calls from the last few weeks because of the storms and things of that nature. And I can help you from stem to stern, from your home, to your auto, to your commercial and business. And if you have some other things that you do as far as life insurance and other activities that you might have or needs that you might have as well. But some of those people found out the wrong time that they didn't have the right insurance when that storm hit the other week. So be proactive and give me a call. You know, I, I believe in consultation and education. So I'm looking forward to that and just looking forward to hearing some nuggets today from Ms. Bea. All righty. So before we get going, Chris, why don't you go ahead and open this up in prayer? Okay. Heavenly Father, we first and foremost thank you, dear God, to let us weather the storm of the, the winter storm of the other week. You know, we phrase a new had a new phrase went from COVID to snow it. And we know people are still suffering all over the country and especially in Texas as well. And we ask you to God to put your hands of healing and resources for these people so they can get back to restoration and where they were before the storm happened. And just to help them to understand that you're there and you're the true and the only God through your son, Jesus Christ, everything can be done. We just ask you to help them to be patient and just have a mindset of love. And those of God who didn't have problems and who had the resources, let them be a blessing to others as well to help those people to get restored as well. These are blessings we ask in your son's name we pray. Amen. 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 So without further ado, I am going to introduce Miss Bev Wright. Um, Bev has been so special and she's been very instrumental uh, in my life. I, goodness, I, I had to dig up something, Bev. I dug up and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read this. I dug up an email and this was the first time I reached out to you back in October of 2006. So this uh, year will be 15 uh, years. <laughs> I say, hello, Ms. Wright. My name is Rosalind Booker. I have a very personal, unique reason for contacting you. I read an article in which you were featured uh, entitled, A Listen to an Executive Coach, which was in March 2003, the issue of Eclipse, which displayed your passion to improve performance and enhance the quality of lives. Not going to read everything, but the fact was, I said, I'm seeking an audience with you. This may be an unusual and far-fetched request, but I believe if I keep reaching and seeking to the right people, they will fall in my path. Your schedule is hectic. Please take a moment and review my earnest request. I would love to treat you to lunch or dinner, have a brief meeting. And uh, your assistant at that time, Miss uh, Nimrod, mm -hmm. arranged the meeting for us. And that's where it all began. And I will say, um, it kind of blew my mind. And you tell me, like, well, honey, I, my, my fee is $350, really, a $350. <laughs> well, I'm like, ooh, honey, I cannot afford you. But by the grace of God, what are they, what's about the to say? Just the crumbs from the table has helped me. And uh, I just really appreciate, uh, Bev, you being a coach, a leader. I mean, you've, you've worked at, at IBM, I think 38 years and retired there. You helped so many people. You continue to mentor and coach so many around the world, um, you know, you're watering, you've planted seed and definitely we see the increase. I say we see the increase because I have seen the increase exponentially in my life and I continue, you know, at, at our annual uh, coffee, dinner, lunch uh, to just really glean uh, from you. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce to some present to others, Miss Bev Wright. And Bev, we just want you um, to tell your story uh, from your journey in IBM to reinvent yourself. That's what I'm excited about to a thriving coaching um, business. And we cannot uh, leave out Dallas Dinner Table, which I believe the world needs to hear about all over the globe uh, because what you're doing with equity race relations you know, to have those uh, hard conversation and having been um, a leader and founder, director of that organization, Dallas Dinner Table, it has evolved 
and it's helping our community. So go for it. <laughs> well, I'll try, try not to start off crying. Uh, listening to you talk about, you know, how we met and how long ago it is, time really flies. And probably one of the things that I remember most recently is about two years ago, maybe, I was in a meeting that was hosted by the Atlantic magazine. And I got there um, toward the uh, end of when the meeting was just starting. And so I ended up sitting um, kind of in the middle of the room. And um, I could see the profile of someone, but I wasn't sure that it was Roz um, as I was looking around the room. And so they got to the Q&A part and um, I, heard, I saw her stand up and said, I'm Roz Booker, the CEO of Arbrook Realty. And I was just almost in tears. I'm gonna have to get the <laughs> tissue already. <laughs> because I remembered where we started and how much courage it took for you to say, I'm gonna quit my job as a receptionist because they don't see my, uh, they don't see me. And uh, I just was touched. And to hear you say CEO of Arbrook um, was just emotional for me. And so, um, you know, as you can tell that Roz and I have been down a lot of roads together. And uh, I'm just so proud of what she's doing because that's what it takes. It takes us believing in ourselves and having faith that God has a path for us. And that even though we may not know where it leads, that we're willing to step out and trust him. And so when she had the ribbon cutting for her business and she was sending me names that she said, which name sounds best? And we settled on Arbrook. Uh, and just to see her progress, uh, let you know that we should support each other and be dream builders yeah. and not dream killers, right? Yeah. And yeah. because most of the time, honestly, when people tell you you can't do something, it's more about their fear and not about yours. Woo! Uh, we're gonna pass the plate now. We, we, <laughs> we get ready to take an offering. Yes. Look. So I will, but let me start. I, I was born and raised in Dallas, Texas and grew up in South Dallas when it was a um, village. And so it was different. And one of the things I always say is that um, integration was not our friend. Cause when I grew up in South Dallas, every socioeconomic level lived together because they didn't let us just live anywhere. Even if you had the money to, you weren't able to. So we had the professionals and the blue collar workers and the entrepreneurs all lived in the same neighborhood. And it was such a blessing for me because I graduated from James Madison High School, but I went from first grade to 12th grade in South Dallas. And my class, which is the class of night, James Madison class of 1967, are still together. Wow. We will celebrate wow. our, I think it'll be our 55th, uh, 55th or so um, class reunion. Uh, for our 50th, we went to Punta Cana, about 50 of us. Oh. And we had a ball. So we've been in touch with our teachers that are still living. I talk regularly to my seventh through ninth grade music teacher who's almost 90. How special. She lives, she lives in Denver and she was an important mentor in, in my life. Um, and, uh, and for those of you that know the jazz singer, Diane Reeves, she's the one that started Diane singing. And, um, and so, and Diane lives in Denver as well. And so from, Going from growing up in South Dallas, where I had, that was when you knew all your neighbors and any adult had the ability to correct you if needed without having to check with your parents. Right? Exactly. <laughs> and your, your parents would thank them as opposed, to, exactly. as opposed to saying that they were going to sue them. And mm -hmm. my mom was one of those parents, we lived on the corner and um, she would see kids kind of acting up and she'd go out and stop them and take their name and phone number and say, I'm going to call your parents and tell them how you're acting in public. And believe me, that was enough. And so that's my base of everything else that happened is that I grew up in, in a black village that told me I could do and be whatever I wanted to. And that's what they told all of us. And so one of my new things that I'm working on is a new name for at-risk kids. I hate that title because if we were at risk, we didn't know it. So I've come up with one called Up Kids, Untapped Potential because I do believe that that's really what it is. They need resources, information, and they need our support. So flash forward when I went into IBM in 1974, 
and you could not have been more green than me. I didn't know how to dress. I didn't know anything about corporate. Uh, I was just blessed to have this opportunity that I didn't even recognize the really the level of opportunity that was being presented to me. And at that time, there really weren't that many people that looked like me in positions to develop me. So the people that poured into me were primarily white people. And to this day, I don't know why they chose me. Uh, I work hard, but a lot of people work hard and don't have the blessings that I had because they really surrounded me and taught me. They invested in me. They paid for me to go to training I would not have been able to afford. And from the first day I walked in to the day I walked out 38 years later, they continued to invest in me. So that's why I am so much about development and helping others because people have poured into me. And when I was a teenager, my mother and I had a conversation. I don't even remember how we got on the conversation, but I do remember what she said to me is that uh, God gives it to us so that we have it to share with others, that there won't be many more burning bushes, that it really is for us to be that light for other people. And my parents were um, the foundation for me and my sister, it was just the two of us. They were entrepreneurs. They owned Horace's Barber and Beauty Shop in um, South Dallas that was right across the street from the Fraser Court Projects. And uh, my father used to pay, some of the neighborhood kids would come through on report card day. And they'd show him the report card and he'd pay them for every A. And so uh, I know people now as adults that remember stopping by my dad's shop. Um, and so that was my example as my parents. They were the first leaders. But in uh, my corporate life, I started to really understand the impact of leadership. And I had a manager that decided I should be a formal leader, which was not something that I even thought about. And so long story short, she convinced me that she was the best person to teach me about leadership because she said, I made every mistake there was to make. I'm the best person to tell you all the things not to do. Mm -hmm. And she spent a year of her life with us meeting on a regular basis and letting me go through her mail and telling me what to do with things and uh, and then eventually asking me, what would you do with this when this hits your desk? And when she was promoted, she recommended me as her backfield. And that was my first, my first management job. And what I learned is that, uh, and she gave me some pieces of advice. She said, you have a really strong sense of right and wrong, but you need to learn to pick your battles or you'll wear yourself out from the inside. Mm. I was concerned that I couldn't be uh, I'm not a company speak person. And I said to her, I said, I'm not sure that they really want me to be a manager because I don't do company speak, right? I don't just say what they want me to say if I don't believe it. And um, and so she told me to- In that, uh, you don't fit the culture? Oh yeah, <laughs> exactly, exactly. There's always a code, right? And yes. So, but one of the things she told me is you could learn from every person you meet, you either learn what to do or what not to do to look for the lesson. And I have used that every single day of my life is that you can certainly learn. And there's a reason that you these people have been put in your path. It may be for you to learn what to do. It oh, may be not. for you to learn what not to do. But right. there is a reason. It is not accidental that you have met. And you just need to figure out what it is you're supposed to learn from that. Um, and so Stacy invested so much in me. Um, and it taught me a lot about prejudging people as well, because when she became my manager, she's if she stood up to her full height, she's probably not 5'1". And, um, and she was a lot younger than me. So I'd made up this whole story about how hard it was going to be for me to work for her and wow. all those things because she was going to have to show me who the boss was. And she really was pivotal in my career because she invested in me like I still can't understand to this day. So when I retired, she had long left IBM to be a stay-at-home mom, but I invited her to one of my retirement events. Um, and it really was just special for me to have her there because she had set me on that path. Um, and so the work I do now is because of leadership. I know that it is the difference maker. If you look around our country, our city, uh, our communities, it's always about leadership. Leadership defines the culture, uh, just like in your family, the, your parents, whomever your parent figure is, that many times is the culture that you're immersed in first. And so I work with leaders that uh, want to be people-centered leaders, meaning that they know people are human, 
and that they need to build trusting relationships with them and your teams. When you become a leader, you're no longer the show. This is one of my friends says this. He said, I want to be the platform now, not the show. Because when you have people working for you as a team, they are the show. You are there to support and guide and be available. And it's so some good nuggets. Yeah. And so <laughs> oh, that, that is what Wisdom. I work toward with the people that um, that I coach and even with my ongoing uh, development as a leader. I think you can lead from wherever you are. Long before I had the title of leader, I think mm -hmm. people saw me as a leader because I wanted to support people and be available for them. Um, so that's what I spend most of my time doing. The other thing is um, the the nonprofit that I've chaired since 2002. I didn't create it. It was created by the Leadership Dallas Alumni Board that was in place when the James Byrd dragging death occurred in Jasper, Texas. And they decided that they needed to do something to bring people of different races together so that we would see each other as humans and not be able to do something that horrific to another human. And they wanted it to be a small, intimate conversation in a safe space. I joined the board uh, when they were trying to figure out how to keep it alive, because that's not the primary uh, role of the chamber. And I had some ideas on how they might transition it to an independent nonprofit. So I've been the chair since 2002. Uh, we are now evolving from just Dallas Dinner Table, which will continue to exist, to America's Dinner Table so that we can take it across the U.S. Over the years, we've had many uh, organizations and geographies that were interested in having our process uh, shared with them. And so now we are evolving to be able to do that. And we actually, we just finished an event we did for Orange County. There's a group in Orange County, California. Okay. And we trained several of their facilitators because they do something similar, but they wanted to use our process. So now they will be able to deliver the Dallas Dinner Table process under the America's Dinner Table banner to their communities there. And that's one of the ways we're gonna do it is through partnership. Uh, I have to mention that this year our, event, our community event, which is all free, doesn't cost anything because we use all volunteers. It was virtual because of the pandemic, but that allowed us to bring in people as facilitators from other geographies and let them experience it with an eye toward our expansion. So we had great um, participation we also had some wonderful sponsors. So our presenting sponsor this year was the Dallas Mavericks. Uh, they have been so supportive of us and many others, but we were really happy to have them as a presenting sponsor. And then we had PepsiCo and Frito-Lay as um, two other sponsors. Lockheed Martin was also a sponsor. So we're now starting to get much more. We had our best fundraising year ever. Uh, and we were lucky enough to get a grant from the Rainwater Foundation that is going to let us hire our first full-time employee as an executive director. Excellent. So just, wow. just begun, begun well, my, my goodness, you you have said enough in a, in a package. Let's take a moment. Let's go around the room. Chris, I know you got a question. I well, can see it. <laughs> well, hey, well, you know, I was reading your bio and I saw, I saw your favorite book was Dig a Well Before You Get Thirsty. And I think that's huge. I think a lot of people... Wait until they get dehydrated. I just want you to kind of expound that on that as well. Yeah, that is, um, th that's a book really on networking. And one of the um, places, what I always say to people, the worst time for you to network is when you're reaching out to people because you need something. Mm -hmm. You know, the best mm -hmm. time is when you're proactively building your network just to get to know people and have them get to know you. And then when, and then the way I network is asking people, what are they trying to accomplish? If there's mm -hmm. a connection I can make for them, if I can offer them some value when I don't need anything and mm -hmm. I have no expectation of return, what I have experienced is that it will always come back to you bigger than you could have asked for. It yes. Ends with the sincerity of mm -hmm. how can I help you? People look for ways to come back and add value to you. And so, and it will be astounding to you what yeah. happens. And so that really is the, the premise of, uh, of that book is, it's networking, but networking from a place of service and support. I hear you. You just said, give and it shall be given unto you. Mm -hmm. Good measure pressed down, shaking together, running over. Yeah. Yes, that's, that's what you said. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. What, what about you, Miss uh, Rhonda? Yeah, and, and you know what? Chris kind of like hit it on the head because that's one of the things that stuck, uh, stuck in my head and out to me when I was reading the magazine article is you write you you build those relationships when you don't need people 
and uh, it just kind of took me back to when I started, when I uh, received my license as a loan officer, I was actually a member of uh, organizations and I, did, I wasn't even connected as far, you know, when we go into lending, you have to have what they call a sponsor and a lending institution have to sponsor you. And I wasn't even sponsored yet, but I was connected to these people and I was building my relationships when I knew when I left corporate America that I could be able to walk into my purpose instead of building from the ground up. So that was key. And that was the thing that I said, she's, yeah, that was key is that make sure you build those relationships with others when you don't need them. So yeah, so that was powerful. I've got a, a question, Bev. Bev, you, the Shiro equal, we look Shiro up in the dictionary, we're gonna see your picture in there. I'm telling you, <laughs> the, the wisdom and these nuggets for any of the listeners out there, it, it these are rich, meaty, uh, life transforming uh, words that are actually lifting people and pouring into people. Um, and, and at this point in, in stage in your life, you've been through many life seasons. What would you tell your 18 year old self at this point? What would you, what advice would you give your 18 year old? Oh, that's self? good. Yeah, that's good one, yeah. Well, you know, um, as I look back, um, cause I have a, I have a big, well, all my birthdays are big now, but uh, but uh, yesterday was uh, was it yesterday? Yeah, yesterday was my husband Nathan and I. It was our fifty third wedding anniversary. Oh, congratulations! congratulations. congratulations. Later uh, this year, this month actually, on the twenty eighth, I'll be seventy two years old. Oh, I still can't believe that. And uh, wow, so what I would say to my, my young self is that age is just a number. So don't let your age define your dreams uh, because I wake up like a jack in the box every day and I'm wiser now. I have more value to give than I did when I was 20, when I was 30, when I was 40, because I have been on the road. I've learned so much. And right. so when I meet people that are younger than me, they may be in their 50s and they're talking about being old. Uh, concerns me because it's like you get to decide that you know don't ever let anybody put blinders on what you what you can do they can and there's a reason that choice is in the name of my company is right choice group so it's a play on my last name but right. choice has always been important to me and so understanding that even if you decide not to make a choice that's a choice yep right it may be a default choice. So you're mm -hmm. so much better if you decide with intention what you're going to choose. Um, and so that's really what I would say to my, to my young self is that I'd be much more um, confident about the choices that I'm making. And one of the things my mom, another thing my mother said to me when I was raising kids and working and you know, my husband and I were taking one kid each and going different directions and then meeting up at the end of the day. And I said to my mother one day, I said, you know, how did you get all of this done? And so she said, you know what? You just keep putting one foot in front of the other. She said, don't look way down the road because it'll scare you, right? She said, but you just concentrate on that next step and pretty soon the road will be behind you. And that is yes. so true. Yes, yes. You know, Bev, um, as we sat down one time, there was something so resounding that resonated and it was a, definitely a root that has grown. I was in a place years ago because sometimes when you don't know the road, any road will take you anywhere, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. And I had so many gifts and talents and I, I didn't know what to do. I had so many aspirations and many of the talents I was using, I was using it in a service uh, capacity, uh, volunteering. And I never will forget, and I even teach this forward now, Bev. You're like, you're really talented, Roz, and I'm paraphrasing. But she's like, you're like, you really don't know your value. Why are you doing this for free? Why do you continue to do this for free? She's like, and Bev, you said, no one is going to add value to you until you do. And at that moment, I don't know if y'all remember the gong show. It was like <laughs> somebody hit me upside my head. And it's like what she said was very simple. 
But that's why you understand and know for such a time as this, seasons mean everything. And there are people who are called to your life that are anointed, that's the key, yeah. to speak over your life where the light bulb comes on, mm -hmm. that the cobwebs are removed. At that moment, man, I got some, I got the jelly out of my back. <laughs> I dried up some tears. I put a price tag on a brochure. And guess what? Someone hired me for that price. I, I was broke as a joke, but I did have nuggets and talents. I went and worked for an attorney. Um, and she actually said, name the price. And she thought the price I named was too low. So I'm like, I inched it up a bit. She's like, well, what about your gas mileage? She added that on. I'm like, and in the back of my head, I'm like, that bill is bad. Boy, that bill is bad. <laughs> I said, oh, we. So, you know, the journey evolved from, you know, that um, stream of income to I'm walking out of this door. I'm getting out of this seat. I'm going to get up off the floor begging God saying, please, please show me, please show me to get up and get back out there, get back in the race. And, you know, I, I went to work for a very special broker um, and, you know, time was up. You have to know when time is up and God has said to you, you've birthed enough dreams of others. When are you going to do it for yourself? And Bev, again, I, I just appreciate all the nuggets. And uh, I remember one time we, we sat down at a restaurant and you gave me this book, Women. Oh, you can't see it in here. Yeah. Here you can. There you go. Women don't ask. Yeah. <laughs> Women don't ask. And they Man, this book, <laughs> this book, this book preached to me. <laughs> this book preached to me. Because women have an issue with asking. We're celebrating today. We're celebrating women celebrating. who made history, women that are making history. And if you're a woman and you're listening, guess what? We're celebrating you. You're a shero too. You are phenomenal. You're fearfully and wonderfully made. God has an awesome plan for you. But I did not realize how much or how much stock I put in relationships in terms of me not being willing to ruffle the feathers because I was more concerned about the value of what I may be getting in that relationship versus speaking my truth, versus standing up uh, in an authentic way and being willing to lose but gain what I needed to grow to the next level. So not like I'm stepping on someone to get somewhere, but merely being your authentic self. And so Bev, I just want you to know it is you um, that really gave me that push to be my authentic self, no matter what, in whatever capacity. So I just wanted to share that with the, the listening audience and those who will be replaying and wanted to share that with you. That is great. I'm, I'm just really proud of, uh, proud of you, Roz, and all that you've accomplished and all the things that you're doing to give back. I think it is really special. And that's the whole point is that yeah. we have these gifts to share with other people. So that is wonderful. And I loved being part of the show today. Absolutely. And, um, uh... And Ms. Beverly, that was one of the points that uh, I know that you said one of the things is just be yourself. Mm -hmm. If there is some pivotal point in your life that you have made that decision, because you know, just like Roz, I'm a people pleaser. Uh, and sometimes I'm also a chameleon. I can uh, conform to anybody at any place at any time. Mm -hmm. And that's what I had tried to do most of my life is just make sure that I fit in. But at some point, it was a point in my life where I said, you know what, I am who I am. I'm not going to try and conform, you know, to who people are. I'm going to be me and I'm going to be okay with that. And if that's the silly, fun, you know, energetic Rhonda, then that's going to be, and I'm not going to make excuses for that. So where, at what point in your life you made that decision or whether with you all of your life, if that's something that was embedded in you as a child, um, how did that come about in your thought process? You know, I think that, um, that I have always been, 
the person that wanted to help everybody else be okay. So I was the kid yeah. that said, we're going to all hold hands and cross the street together. When I'm <laughs> yeah. I have always been the person that wants everybody to win. Um, and I think when I mentioned that my high school class that we still get together, I started that with a slumber party at my house with just a few of the girls. And we had so much fun because we had been together. My, my best friend is the first person I met the first day of first grade. And uh, now I'm talking to her grandchild <laughs> who is in her first big job wow. um, and had talked wow. to her daughter before that. And so we have all, some of our kids have gone to college together. They think we're crazy because they've never known people that have been together since first grade that have stayed together. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think wow. I've kind of been that. But when I when you go into corporate, that's different because many times they want you to be, um, you know, to fit. Right. And okay. so I think when I stopped worrying about fitting, I was just having this conversation the other day because mm. I don't know if when I started with IBM, I would have been comfortable wearing my hair the way I do now. I used to have hair that was down the middle of my back. And I spent a lot of time on my hair, going to the beauty shop, sitting up under the dryer for two hours every time because it was heavy. And when I turned, it was either in my mid 40s or maybe 50, I started really looking at how did I spend my time and was it where I wanted to spend my time. And I thought about how much time I wasted on my hair, you know, getting there, getting it done. And my folks were in the hair business. They, they owned a barber and beauty shop, so I never had to pay anybody to do it but until I got to be an adult, but it was the time factor for me. And so I decided to uh, cut my hair off and wear it natural. And it was so freeing, but I'm not sure if when I started at IBM, uh, cause I remember one day wearing an African print um, top to work after I'd been there for a long time. So I had a reputation and all of that, but somebody commented and said, oh, Bev, you're always surprising us, right? And so, um, and I, and I basically said, there's more to come, right? <laughs> so, right? It's going to be the last surprise, right? Well, and so I think it was somewhere around there that, and here's the thing. I saw a quote that said, be yourself. Everyone else is taken. Right. That's, I love that. You know, it's better for you to be a authentic yes. you than a poor copy of somebody Someone else. Right. Yeah. That is that's, that's awesome, Beth. I it is very powerful. Um, I, I'm with you. I, back in college, for me, is my pivotal point. I I couldn't do it. I mean, when you're going and getting one taco on Sunday because you you digging through the seats and everything, trying to find you know these few because because the cafeteria is closed, hair was the last thing you could really worry about. You know, a hair and all these products and different things. So when you start doing you know, making sense of what is priority and most important to you. Exactly. That for me was that education piece. And so I, I myself ended up working uh, a full-time job through the day and going to school through night. And I connected with night schoolers who were adults. So I was this young person going into night school, working through the day and still found a way to do my own hair, do my own change my own oil, you know, I, you know, was that drive to say, I'm, I'm get, I got to get this done. I got to get through this yeah. is, is when I hear your words and I hear how many people that you had pouring into you this for this month of women and who we lock arms with and celebrating each other and lifting each other up, you're just sharing your, just about yourself and about your life those ins inspirational nuggets really empower, I know me and, and, and inspiring to say, you know, who is in my circle and who do we have yeah. around us that's leading and pouring into us and mentoring us. And as you talked about, you're you locking arms with your first and second grade uh, group and all these years later, y'all are still connected. It's that camaraderie and that fills us and fuels us. And it is, a, I believe, a healthy aspect of what gives us longevity and vitality and mm -hmm. uh, again in our reach of our community and we we can do more together so i absolutely love uh what you're sharing and it's i know a lot of people out there love the same so you are so appreciated for being here and babe, i want to mention too because you know you're talking about you evolve 
And one thing I like what you said too, because we talk about this all the time, being your authentic self and being you. And like when a person asked you about, you know, taking that position on, you said, hey, that's not me. And I think a lot of times people get out of themselves and don't say true to themselves when they get in those positions. And I said, being African-American, we gotta be true to ourselves because if we don't, we try to assimilate too much and don't stay true to ourselves, they'll run over us. But I said, I, I use the term people, I always tell people, they said, Chris, you speak up a lot. I said, I'm professionally militant, you know? I try to speak in a, you know, elephant, you know, way, you know, that's, cause we don't want to be labels the angry black woman or the angry black man, but you can talk, you can speak strong with, you know, the way you speak in a professional manner and it gets your point across. And I think that's huge that we do that. And I commend you for doing that as well. Well, you know, honestly, uh, being truthful to myself was one of the things that made me successful in corporate, I believe, because uh, many of the people that I coached, and I coached a lot of our leaders uh, when I was there, I created an a inter a, a internal coaching program inside a big company. So I thought of myself as an entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. I got to do those things uh, with like that. resources. Yeah. But uh, one of the things that um, that I know about leadership, the higher up you go, the more filtered you are. People mm -hmm. try not to give you bad news. And sometimes that's exactly what you need so that you know what needs to be changed or, or paid attention to. And so they would many times come to me or I would go to them and say, here's my observation. I want you to be the best leader you can be. And here's some things you might want to take a look at. And that became something that they'd come to me for and seek and say, you know, I really want to know what people think of me, what my, uh, what I need to do differently as a leader to have the best organization that I can. And so I used to always say, don't ask me for my opinion if you don't want it. Exactly. <laughs> so, that, you know, Cause I'm not exactly. going to soft pedal it because, and so behind closed doors with just me and one other person, I was pretty fearless about, uh, because I really cared about them as leaders. Right. Mm -hmm. And I had the chance to work with some leaders that I saw make adjustments. I coached a couple of uh, leaders for two years that were in the military, and they were fabulous to work with. And I thought they'd be real resistant, but uh, they really were great wow. leaders because if you gave them evidence of something that they needed to change, they were used to implementing orders. Right. And so they said, oh, okay, this is a problem. You say this will work. And so we're going to try that. And they were fabulous to work with. Bab, I have a, a question for you um, because you, you've obviously mastered speaking the truth in love. You've all, you've said it over and over. You really genuinely care about people. And I think that is kind of the hook when people know you genuinely care, whatever you have to tell them, you know, even though it's going to, to hurt and sting a little, they're receptive. But as women, who tell the truth, we can be perceived as the B. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So Sorry. what Sorry. advice, what, <laughs> you know, what Chris, advice? Chris. I don't worry, I'll tell you about it something. Be good. I'll tell you about something yeah. that happened when I was in uh, corporate. Um, my manager at the time was another woman and she was someone that I had been friendly with before she became my, my boss. And she came to town. She lived in a different, I, I was responsible for Dallas, Atlanta, and Toronto. Um, and um, so she was in Atlanta. She came to visit us in Dallas. And she calls me when I was driving home. And she said, you know, I just met with some people on your team. And, um, you know, there are a couple of them that don't like you. And I think you'd better, you know, do something about that. And so I took a deep breath and I said, you know, um, if you said they didn't respect me, I'd be concerned. Mm -hmm. Wow. Exactly. I don't really care that exactly. they don't like me. And exactly. would you be having this conversation if I were a man? Mm -hmm. And she paused and she said, you're right. Never mind. So that really was because there, there's, um, and, and there were times, there was at least a couple of times that I can remember where I was one of few women in our leadership team and we'd meet and the men would all be talking and talking and I can't even share to you the name with you the name that one of the ladies gave them that uh, where the men were always talking to make sure somebody knew they they were in the meeting, but I remember uh, one of them called and left a voicemail for me, and said, "Bev, I need you to go jump on this right now," and 
I don't even remember picking up the phone. I dialed it so fast and left him a message through my teeth and said, don't you ever call me again and leave me a message like that. You are not my boss. You are my peer. Mm -hmm. said, you need to talk to me like a peer. And so for the next, I don't know, months, every time he'd come in, now, Bev, I don't want you to get upset. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so I think sometimes you have to know when you need to hold your boundaries as a woman. Because I've sat in meetings where they've said things like I remember them talking about uh, one of the other female leaders who always made her sales numbers because I grew up in a sales organization. But one of the leaders said, you know, she's kind of motherly and it wasn't a compliment. Oh. And I thought, now, they wouldn't be saying that about a man. Right. So I think we have to stand up for ourselves and for each other. Um, right. and one of the things that I was always clear about is I refuse to be part of a stereotype. So there's a stereotype that women can't work together. Oh. And so we, I had at one time two leaders, female leaders, that were almost publicly feuding. And I went mm -hmm. to both of them individually and said, if for no other reason that they think we can't work together, I would refuse to be part of a stereotype. You all need to get together and fix this. Whatever oh. it is, you just need to fix it because it's too public and it makes it, it feeds into the stereotype. Mm -hmm. And so they, they did respond then. It wasn't like they, they embraced each other, but they at least started being civil right. uh, and working through their issues like leaders. And so <laughs> now I, I believe that, that it works when we, and, and one of the reasons I'm such a big believer in straight talk is because early in my career, I received some. And even though it stung at the time after I thought about it, I knew that it was truthful and something I needed to pay attention to. And if he had not been that honest with me, I probably would have continued to be um, working with a false narrative. Uh, and it took me another year to earn that promotion that I thought they were going to give me any day. And he told me straight to my face, he said, you've done a good job, but we've got somebody that's done a better job and they're going to be promoted first. Here are the one or two things we want you to continue working on. And I was crushed in the moment. But when I started thinking about it, I thought, you know, I was so sure that I was about to be promoted. I probably wasn't focusing on this job as much as I should have because I thought <laughs> I was getting ready to go to the new job, right? right? And so it took me another year. But when I got that promotion, he had then moved to a different organization. But I picked up the phone and called him a yeah. year later and said, I wanted you to know that I got that promotion and I appreciate what you told me. Hey, Bill, you know, I have a question for you. I'm really big on civic and community engagement. I saw your, your bio and I see you do a lot of things. How has your professional life and personal life affected that or vice versa? Uh, I think they're very integrated. Um, and once, man, people ask me, you know, how do you make time for all this? Well, my kids have been grown for a long time. I have really old kids. Right? <laughs> and so they are fully adults and have been. And so it was funny because we I was one of the charter members for... Uh, the North Suburban Dallas Jack and Jill chapter. That was a meeting I had this morning before uh, I'm in the associates group now. And I remember when my last child was graduating from Jack and Jill, that's when you, the mother graduates. And so this really nice woman came and uh, as my son was graduating, he was the youngest. And she said, I'm starting a support group for the graduating mothers because I know this will be a big shift. And I thanked her. I said, you are so kind. I said, but I don't need a support group. I have plans. I said, I've been pouring into these kids. I'm going all in for me now, right? It's all about me. And so uh, so I think that once, you know, my kids were up um, and, and I did that with my career too. Early in my career, when my kids were younger. I took jobs that were more nine to five at IBM. And then when I got to a point where my husband and I thought we could work where I could travel more, I could work longer hours, we had a family meeting and said, can we pull this mm -hmm. off? And so we came up with some strategies we needed to get the kids picked up from daycare because they charged you a million dollars a minute if you were oh. you know, late, right? Mm -hmm. And exactly. so we did all of that stuff. And then in the summer, I actually hired somebody um, usually an older team that was um, Red Cross certified and could drive so that my kids didn't have to get up all summer long. Uh, they were able to stay home. This person came into my home, kept my kids, took them for field trips, all of that kind of stuff every summer uh, because I didn't want them to feel like little soldiers because I wanted to work. Um, and then when my son was uh, born, I took a year off from IBM. And so I was blessed to work for a company that really made it pretty easy uh, for you. It was family friendly from the very beginning. So, so I don't care about all you women, because the thing is, I was here 
especially for African American women, I'm very, it's like it's routine for them. But I hear, I work with people in the past in corporate America who are Anglo and other races, and they make it seem like it's a big deal to do what you, you, you ladies, all you ladies do. And I know that you do, and like my wife has done, but they make it seem like it's something unique. And you guys do that all the time. I just want to pass off to all y'all for what y'all does. I know you guys personally as well. So I just want to say hats off to you guys as well. Yeah. Well, that's Thank why it's very important for, and it's better now than it used to be uh, for a company. And, and one of the things that I've seen in younger uh, men is that they really insist on working for companies that make it easy for them to support their families more as well, to be there to coach and to, you know, help with child care and uh, all of those kinds of things. And you're starting to see, and it started a while back, some women and couples are making the decision that the wife's uh, career is primary and oh, yeah. the husband chooses mm -hmm. to stay home and, and raise the kids because they, mm -hmm. they uh, think that they're in a better position to do that. So I think that, uh, and as I talk to young men, some of the men that I coach, uh, they ask me as many questions about how to sustain a long marriage relationship as they do about career. That's wow. really important. Yeah. So that's encouraging to me because they oh, want to know those kinds of things. Uh, I remember, I, I, I have, go ahead go ahead Melly Mel oh no I was just making a point you were talking about the dynamics are shifting in relationship to companies being more family friendly and work life balance which is key because we are um, we're, we're, there's a lot of powerhouse energy going on and balancing multiple things and, and you know we have those heart for service as well as uh, making a uh, uh, an impact in our communities and working and bringing a living home. You know, there's a lot of people that do have an issue with balance and making sure that, you know, they're spending the quality of time they need with their family. So I do agree that work is influ influential in helping get people on a better track and people are demanding that. So uh, it's pushing now with COVID with the remote now it's like, oh, now why don't we thrust in something that is more of a level of now we have to adjust to this new normal. So people are weaving and, and uh, ebbing and flowing to different changes that we're having to adjust to that we're thrust into. So it's been rough for a lot of people, but a lot of people are looking and, and taking ownership of this remote uh, work. And it is changing the dynamic of families and they're either getting stronger or they're not getting stronger uh, based upon. So there's still that balance and, and it's definitely needed. So I'm encouraged by that young man or those young uh, men asking about how to keep their families uh, that sounds, strong. That, that that, that is, yeah, that is, that's pretty amazing. Go ahead, Ross. Bev, as we um, round up here, you know, a lot of people are going to be emerging as entrepreneurs, those that have been furloughed, underemployed, uh, laid off. Um, and with that, um, what advice would you give someone that's coming from a corporate job? Maybe they've been there 20, 30 years, 35, 40 years, and they're having to wade in the new pool of entrepreneurship. That's quite different um, to come from a corporate environment to you're the CEO, CFO, customer service person. The janitor. <laughs> what, <laughs> yeah. what advice right. would you give them other than you need to see Bev? But. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, um, this was something I, I actually learned. I think, number one, I mentioned that my parents were entrepreneurs. And so I think I've always kind of had that, you know, model in front of me. Uh, and what I say now is that every person is in a one person company. Even if you work for a company now, you are actually a set of skills and experiences that you're taking into the, the uh, career marketplace. And so you really need to understand that from the beginning, even if you work for a company for as long as I did, it'll be nine years, uh, April 1st, since I awesome. left IBM. And, but I planned my exit two years before I left. Wow. And that was the financial piece, the, you know, what do I need in terms of environment? Like I enjoy people, a lot of the people that are in, in business that I'm in, in coaching, they're solopreneurs and they talk about being lonely, uh, working, you know, in their work environment because they don't have people around them. Well, I create community. I knew that was important for me. 
And so I had in 2010, I told them I was leaving in 2012 and I left exactly when I said I was going to leave. And because it was April 1st, I didn't realize that was April Fool's Day. So they thought I was joking. Oh my. But I said, no, it just so happens that my work anniversary was March the 4th and you can only retire at the beginning of a month. At least that was the way it was when I was there. So I had to go through all of March to make it an even 38 years, right? Oh, and wow. so that's how I got to the April 1st date. But uh, I, I say, one of my friends has a saying where she says, and she's been an entrepreneur for a long time. She said, I, I sat down and had a meeting with myself, right? Mm -hmm. And thought through some things. So I suggest sitting down and having a meeting with yourself as soon as you can not only to figure out what you're doing now, but what do you want your future life to look like? Mm -hmm. You know, how long do you want to work? I'm coaching a young man now that knows exactly the day that he's planning to work. He said, I've got nine years. She said, if, he said, if I can accelerate something, I've only got five. He already knows where he's going to buy his retirement home. He knows the community, the state, everything. He knows what he wants to do. This is a young black man. He's, and I, we had a, I asked him something one day and he said, oh, I don't really care what they think. He's the only people I care about, um, about what they think of me as my wife and my kids. And he said, everybody else is just along for the ride. And he is very specific. Uh, and I love that because you don't meet that many people that have done that level of play. We put more intention into what we're going to wear to an event mm -hmm. than we do into planning our life. It, are your papers, you know, what if something happens to you? Do you have all of your papers together? When my mom died suddenly, two, we had our funeral in two days. She had everything in one place. Her funeral was paid for. She had told us what she wanted done for that. She had all of, she was the last of her nine brothers and sisters to go. She had all their obituaries in one place. So we had all the family history there. And so even though it was sudden and unexpected, um, she had been preparing us for this our whole lives. Uh, and that's a gift to your family. Oh, and one yeah. of the things my mother used to say to us is she said, you know, um, it's not going to help for everybody to be broke, right? She said, so put your little money back, right? And so those were things that my sister and I were raised with. And you're not going to catch us out with no money, right, on our, on our person. It's going to be somewhere in our car. Because she told us, you don't, you don't go out without money because everything Absolutely. you can't put on a credit card and then neither should you, right? <laughs> Absolutely, yes. Yeah, yes. so those Boy. are the things that I think uh, is that they really need to sit down and, and carve out time on their calendar to really sit down and think about who they are, who they wanna be, if there's a gap between who they are and who they wanna be and put some milestones in place. And even if you have to get an accountability partner, it doesn't have to be a coach, it can be a good friend. It can mm -hmm. be someone that's a mentor, but hold yourself accountable to build the life that you want. It won't go perfect, but you'll have a much better shot of coming out the way you want it if you have a plan. I'm telling you, we had some coaching church today. Yes. Um, I like that last part. If there's a gap between who you are and who you want to be, sit down, have a meeting with yourself. <laughs> <laughs> Feel the gap. That, Bev, is that the me incorporated? Uh, is that some of the topics that you discuss? I love that. That, that is uh, me incorporated. It talks about your brand and it talks about all the other things that you are one person company. Um, and I've talked to people and here's the thing, your brand should not be completely connected to your company. I can't tell you how many people I meet where they've been with a company forever and they're used to saying I'm Bev Wright from IBM. And then when they leave IBM, they say, I'm Bev Wright, and they think, well, what does what can I say that'll make them know that I'm special or that I have skill or whatever? Because their brand was too connected only. It was their brand. identity. Yeah. And exactly. And so yeah. you need to start building that brand separate from the your company, the work you do. Who are you as a person? And who do you want to be known as? That's awesome. Well, Bev, Ooh. I'm telling you, it has been such a pleasure <laughs> having you. Yes, oh my God, I we could go I home. Love with, I love what you all are doing. I think it is really special. I'm, I'm thrilled to be a part of it today. Well, how can people reach you, Bev? Uh, they can reach me at my website, www.rightchoicegroup.com. My last name, W-R-I-G-H-T, rightchoicegroup.com. Awesome. And again, thank you so much for 
everyone listening and those who are going to replay, I'm Roz V, Ask Roz V, Principal Broker, CEO of Arbrook Realty, where we birth dreams and build legacies in real estate. There's no dream left behind. If you need special services and you want to purchase a home, lease a home, sell a home with optimal service, call us at 972-679-9311. Again, that's 972-679-9311. Melanie? Hi. Yes, thank you, Roz. Uh, it's been a blessing today, just a total blessing. And thank you, Bev. I am Melanie Williamson, and you can reach me for credit education, credit restoration uh, across DFW, as well as across the United States. My callback number is 469-403-8394. Again, that's 469-403-8394. I look forward to hearing from you. Rhonda? I'm Rhonda Hutchison. I'm the Lone Lioness, and I'm with Paramount Residential Mortgage Group. You can give me a call at 214-856-3747. That's 214-856-3747. You can contact me for all your residential mortgage needs. That can be from investment property to a primary residence. I'm here to serve. Mr. Chris? And Bev, once again, I'm looking forward to chatting with you offline as well because I was really engaged in what you had to say and look forward to talking to you as well personally. But I'm Chris Ziegler with the Ziegler Agency Allstate located in Frisco, Texas, taking care of all your service needs in the insurance industry, whether it be personal, commercial, or even life insurance, and plus many more things that I do as well. But I can be reached at 214-870-4269. Once again, I can be reached at 214-870-4269. If you need education consultation, I'm here for you. And still got a lot of calls coming in from that storm a couple of weeks ago. So don't hesitate to reach out. Even if you're not my customer, I'd be more than happy to try to get the direction in the right direction. Well, that's all we have time for today. And Beth, again, thank you. You are my thank shero. You. Love you. Hugs and kisses. And until next time, y'all go be great. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.